It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Try Haven Brand Soil Conditioners providing generations of gardeners with a truly all-natural alternative to chemical fertilizers with their line of composted manure and alfalfa teas. Easy to brew and use on all indoor and outdoor plants. Find them online at manuretea.com. Hey, thanks for joining us for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. Today we have part two of our Winter Rose Tales series. These tales feature the gardeners, their gardens, and what they do to care for their roses in winter. Regardless of where you grow roses, I'm sure you'll enjoy each of these rose stories. It's fascinating to hear uh, just how different it can be or how similar it can be growing roses in different parts of the country. First up, we'll hear from Nate Fisher in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And then next, we'll travel to Amelia Courthouse, Virginia, and hear from Julie Ashman. Then on to Colorado to hear from Matt Douglas. He's the owner of High Country Roses. And we'll finish up this episode in Southern California with Donna Malazzo. So grab your favorite steaming cup and enjoy these winter rose tales. Hello, everyone. My name is Nate Fisher. So for a little bit of background about me, I started growing roses in 2014 when I was 23. I joined ARS in April of 2020, and I started up the local chapter, the Lehigh Valley Rose Society, and became a consulting rosarian in April of this year. I received the ARS Rising Star Award in 2021, and last year I also designed a public rose garden for Hopewell Park in Center Valley, Pennsylvania. Uh, it features 672 roses and 576 perennials. LVRS has to date raised $94,305 and we are on track to begin planting next month. I am a botany and plant pathology major through Oregon State University's eCampus program with particular interest in edaphology and plant virology. My wife and I purchased our current home in October of 2020 and had pretty much a blank slate in our yard for gardening. Our backyard was all grass with a concrete sidewalk down the middle and an overgrown lilac bush growing up against our garage. The yard was fenced in with a chain link fence covered in English ivy. We wound up hiring someone to remove the concrete walkway, but my wife and I did the rest of the work ourselves. We removed all of the English ivy, we removed the chain link fence, removed the grass and removed the lilac bush. I built a six and a half foot tall wooden fence with horizontal slats spaced about two and a half inches apart. Um, that gives us some privacy from our neighbors while also still allowing sunlight to come through. We amended the soil with mushroom compost and aluminum sulfate. The pH was around 8.6 from the concrete dust that was left behind from the jackhammering of the walkway. Our property is 0 0.055 acres, so we have a very small yard, but by removing all of the grass and strategically constructing and placing a couple of raised beds, we now have 102 roses, a vegetable garden, and several pollinator-friendly perennials throughout both the front and backyards. In terms of roses, I tend to favor English shrubs and floribundas, but this year I made a conscious effort to branch out a bit and have added additional hybrid teas, grandifloras, minifloras, polyanthas, and miniatures. Uh, we also have seven climbers. Um, six are being trained on arbors and one we are training at the side of our garage. A lot of my roses are own root roses. Some of them are grafted onto Dr. Huey rootstock and some of them are grafted onto multiflora. The ones that are on multiflora are in raised beds as um, multiflora roses have a tendency to pick up salts and particularly don't like alkaline soils. Um, so with those issues that we've had with the pH of our soil and ground, we figured it was better to just put them in the raised beds. 
So I am located in eastern Pennsylvania, which is in USDA zone 6B, which is a minimum average temperature of negative 5 degrees to 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of Pennsylvania falls in the 6A to 6B range, though portions of it, mainly in the southeast, are 7A or 7B, and portions of the north, northwest, and a stretch of higher elevation running down the middle of Pennsylvania are in zones 5A and 5B. So when I purchase new roses, I pay attention to the zone they are rated for, and I always check more than one website. I've noticed that the uh, zone ratings for um, a lot of different roses can vary from site to site. Some will say six, some will say five, some will say seven. So I tend to look at multiple different sites until I have some sort of consensus. Um, if I put a rose in a pot, I make sure that it's rated for zone five, uh, just as an extra precaution and I plant them in, um, they're marketed as frost-resistant flower pots. Um, they're like a, a glazed pot. Um, you can typically find them at places like Lowe's. Um, I make sure that the pots have at least an 18-inch diameter at the narrowest point of the pot and um, are at least 18 inches tall. Typically, I try and get pots that are larger than that, though. Um, when I do plant a rose in a pot, I typically place it against uh, either the fence or a raised bed or on the side of our kids' playhouse, um, different spots like that to offer some extra wind protection. Um, the best winter protection for our area for roses is basically to ensure that they go into the cold weather as healthy roses. If they're struggling at the end of summer and in the fall, they're more likely to die during the stress of cold weather in the winter. So I make sure to continue fertilizing regularly through the summer with my last round of fertilizing at the end of August, um, no later than September 5th, to avoid having tender new growth at the first frost six weeks later. For our area, it's typically around October 17th. I continue to spray. We maintain an organic garden, so our fertilizer and any sprays that we use are organic. Um, fungicides and pesticides through the summer and the fall, making sure to spray in the early morning before it gets too hot outside. Especially this year, we've had a lot of days in the upper 80s into the 90s. So um, in an effort to prevent the leaves from burning, we try and spray in the early morning. Um, we have a backpack sprayer, which is nice. We just got that uh, this year, I believe. Um, so we can mix various concentrates with water in the backpack sprayer and then just walk around through the yard. Um, it's a little bit of strain on the back, but it does make it easier to go around and do all of the roses fairly quickly. Um, during this routine of walking through the garden, usually once a week or so to spray or fertilize or whatever we wind up doing, um, it's also a good time to look at the roses and remove any diseased or dead canes as you're going. Um, towards the end of October, I try to remove some of the thinner and weaker canes. Um, if there's any canes on a particular rose that are much higher than the rest of them, I, I tend to prune that back. We get a lot of uh, wind in the winter and in an effort to uh, reduce the sort of wind rock that you can get, which can loosen the, the roots in the soil. I, I try and reduce that possibility as much as, as possible. Um, so I also make sure to remove any foliage that um, shows signs of black spot, and I try to thoroughly rake it up off of the ground in an effort to um, make sure that it doesn't overwinter. I have a hand rake that is made by Bond, that works really well for that. Um, again, that was a purchase that we just had this year that has made a huge difference and it makes that process go a lot faster. Um, so after the leaves on the ground are removed, I don't do an entire layer throughout the entire garden, but I do try and add mulch wherever it's particularly needed. We use a triple shredded hardwood mulch. Um, I prefer this to the dyed mulches that you can get. 
Um, it breaks down fairly quickly, which is great for the health of the soil, but it also can lead to thin patches here and there. Um, so I want to make sure to have a nice, thick, solid layer of mulch before it gets too cold, um, again, to help with winter protection. Uh, I am grateful that in our zone, we don't need to go to some of the extremes that um, some of our zone five friends have to go through to protect their roses. So basically, by the time spring comes around, if there are any roses that haven't survived the winter, well, it's survival of the fittest in my garden. So they get shovel pruned and then there's a new space for a new rose for the following year. The last frost date for our zone is typically April 26th but by late March and into early April, I usually start going through the roses to see how they fared the winter, and then I prune them to get them ready for the new growing season. Hello, my name is Julie Ashman, and I will be talking to you today about winterizing your roses. Growing roses is my passion. I'm American Rose Society Consulting Rosarian. Therefore, I enjoy helping others successfully grow roses in Virginia which is in plant zone 7A. I will be giving you helpful information to winterize your roses from my own garden here on Grub Hill Farm in Amelia, Virginia. I grow on average around 150 roses now. I've been growing roses for 22 years and it has taught me the importance of winterizing your roses. Let's start by talking about grafted bushes. Grafted bushes are your hybrid teas, grandifloras, and floribundas, which they need extra help to protect their bud unions from the freezing cold temperatures of the winter and the freeze thaw temperatures that occur in the late winter months. Now, to begin for prepping for the winter, once I notice the leaves changing, then I stop cutting the roses. And the bushes form hips to prevent any new tender growth because this tender growth will not survive the winter. And this also allows the bush to harden off, which is important for winter success. Next, I cover the bud union with topsoil. I mound up a collar around the bush and inside and around the bush, I either use mulch, leaves, or straw, which in the past few years I have been using straw, especially in my garden, because it's so accessible here on the farm. The rose collars will protect the grafted roses throughout the dormant winter sleep in a blanket of protection. I then prune back any tall canes on the bush to prevent wind rock from the brutal and harsh winter winds. Now, this assures these roses are protected for the winter. Now we're gonna talk about my tall climbing beauties in the garden. These are my climbing roses. I do not want them whipped by the cold winds either. I use baler twine to secure any canes that need to be stabilized to the structures that they're upon, such as trellises, arbors, or fences. Keeping the long canes stable will decrease damage and ensure stronger canes in the spring. Last but not least are my shrub roses. I shape and tidy up my shrub roses. I rake the soil up to the base and I add just a light layer of mulch. My shrub roses beautify my landscape. Therefore, I want to give them a manicured look for the winter. And this adds to the beauty of my garden. Hopefully, you have enjoyed hearing these helpful hints about winterizing your roses. Remember, a good bedding down for the winter will ensure these sleeping beauties will awake in the spring filled with colorful buds that will burst into lovely blooms in your garden, which then you can add them to your vases, photograph, and share these beauties with your friends and families, and even on Facebook. Thank you, everyone. 
Hello everyone, my name is Matt Douglas and I, along with my wife Jennifer, own and operate High Country Roses and we're located just outside of Denver, Colorado. When Teresa presented this idea of multiple people from multiple regions coming together to talk about their unique winter care challenges, I thought the idea was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, at the nursery, I talk to people across the country every day, and their conditions are all really unique. And honestly, their solutions are equally as unique. Trust me, the first time I heard someone talk about the, uh, the Minnesota tip uh, with their climbing roses, I, I honestly thought they had lost their minds. While the tip is not something I would really want to do on a regular basis, I certainly understand why people do it, and I can definitely res respect it as a creative solution to, the, to a tough problem. So I'm a guy that spends a lot of time in the greenhouse growing roses, and uh, frankly, I don't have a lot of time for my own personal garden, but I do love my garden, and I've had some good success with it. And I'm excited to share with you my Mile High Winter Rose Tales. So to begin with, a lot of people uh, still think Denver is located like right in the heart of the mountains. And while we love our mountains, uh, we're not exactly in the mountains. So Denver is located just east of the Rocky Mountains on the high plains of Colorado. Most of the Denver area is in a growing zone of five or six, and that just kind of depends on what part of town you're in. The biggest factor is our, our growing season is relatively short. Uh, we typically have a last frost around Mother's Day and a first freeze sometime in October. Uh, and, and what that leads to is a lot of winter care. So between those dates, we've, we've got to set ourselves up for success. Jennifer and I live about 20 miles northwest of downtown Denver in a suburb called Arvada. You know, and again, we're not totally in the mountains, but I could be. Uh, you know, I look out my back window and I'm, I'm basically there. If I drive five minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm up in the timber. And, uh, and where we're at, the conditions are a little tougher for growing. You know, we're definitely a zone five. There's no question about that. And our temperatures tend to be about five to 10 degrees colder than, than what we typically get in Denver. And Denver's already challenging enough. So, you know, we'll get, you know, down to minus 10 or minus 15 on a fairly regular basis each year. It doesn't last long, uh, but it's certainly enough uh, to really shock the plants. Up where we are, we've got uh, a little bit of a different challenge, and, and that is being right on the f foothills, um, we really deal with a lot of wind. And we'll have sustained winds of 50 to 70 miles an hour uh, whipping through in the winter. And obviously that is really tricky because not only does it, cause wind chill problems uh, with dieback, but you know, it really can be damaging to the structural integrity of the plants. Um, so that is something we definitely have to kind of keep uh, in touch with. The other thing that we really have to keep an eye on in Denver is um, the fact that we just don't get a lot of moisture in the winter. And that's a little counterintuitive. Um, we get a lot of snow. It's kind of dry snow, to be honest. And we will go stretches without measurable precipitation. I know a couple of years ago, we went almost eight weeks with no precipitation. And that can be so, so damaging to the plants. Um, you know, stressing a plant and then uh, and then freezing it is is a, is not a recipe for success. So despite all these challenges, uh, I've I've had a lot of luck growing roses in my yard. 
I'm currently growing about 150 varieties of old garden roses and modern floribundas and hybrid teas. You know, I've got a, I've got a nice garden of all minis and a few species roses. So I, I really kind of try to mix it up. The one thing I always make sure I do, and really it's my best advice to gardeners around the country, uh, no matter where they are, is to be really cognizant of choosing plants that are zone appropriate. You know, I know with high country roses, we make a, a great effort to kind of uh, confirm both by word of mouth and, and experience uh, an accurate zoning for cold tolerance for plants. So most everything in my yard will be a zone five or hardier plant. So zone five, four, three, two, um, and that's all I'll grow. And, you know, I feel like the best solution for winter care is setting yourself up for it when you select your plants. So that might be the first thing I do, but it's not the last. Uh, and my winter care regimen looks a little bit like this. So in, in my house here in Colorado, we have to keep an eye on our, our, our frost date. And, and honestly, it can be so variable uh, that you kind of just got to guess and go for it a little bit. Uh, so I will fertilize uh, up until really the first week or two in September. That generally gives me a good six week window until we have a hard freeze. And so that also helps us kind of push the plants along um, and, and get the, that last flush of blooms and, and kind of sets things up for the fall. I don't really prune the roses in the fall. I, I have a love for rose hips, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a big deadheader. Um, but I do prune preemptively. And like I had mentioned with the wind issues, you know, I really start keeping an eye out in, um, in early fall for canes that may be susceptible to really getting whipped around in the wind and broken and damaged. Because in that case, I'd much rather cut it back and, 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 you know, lose half of it as opposed to having it broken off at the base and losing the whole thing. Typically, I don't prune, though, in the fall, and that's really uh, just because I'm assuming that I'm going to have some winter damage. And, and assuming that, I really want that winter damage to be on the farthest point it could possibly be from the base of that plant. So after fertilizing in, in September with about six weeks to go to a freeze and, and lightly pruning things and, and kind of selecting those canes I preemptively want to take out, uh, the next thing I do is in October. And at this point, I typically uh, mulch my roses. Uh, and it's maybe a little bit early, but Colorado surprises you. Uh, so, so I like to pile up about six to eight inches high on all the plants and I literally just gather the mulch that I have in the garden around it and I just kind of push it up around the plant. So it's really nothing fancy. Um, you know, because of some of our wind issues, we use a, a lot of gorilla hair mulch, which is maybe a little thicker than ideal. Um, but it really, I don't think matters what you use. Um, I advise people use anything they can get their hands on, including just dirt. Bringing dirt up around the bottom six to eight inches of the plant is pretty darn helpful. You know, I also, because of my uh, time commitments in the spring to the nursery, uh, I plant a lot of roses in, uh, in the fall. And my yard looks really kind of funny because when I plant them, I basically put them in and mulch over the top of them. So, uh, you know, I think a good mulching uh, is great, especially uh, for younger plants. The other thing I start doing in October is I definitely start cutting back on the water. I sort of wean it a little bit 
to to kind of get that uh, get the rows ready for that winter dormancy period. Um, so I typically drip irrigate, you know, three times a week. Um, not for long, but, uh, you know, I'll cut that back to two times a week. And, you know, eventually, you know, the freeze comes and we've got to, we got to turn off the, the water there anyway. So it's just kind of a good easing into, uh, that dormancy period with, with reduced water. So, like I was talking about, though, we do go through periods where it's extremely dry here in Colorado, and and so a lot of times I'm dragging the hose out with a sprinkler on it because it's really important to kind of keep some water on those plants. And uh, and honestly, the best thing I can tell you is is dig a little hole and stick your finger in it because you just want to make sure there's moisture below the surface. Uh, you know, so that you are, are keeping the roots of those plants moist so that they are not dry when you get into a heavy freeze. So as winter comes, uh, I perform one of the funnier things that my neighbor laugh at me about. Uh, I shovel my driveway on top of my roses. So I, I do kind of pack my roses with snow uh, carefully, of course. Uh, I definitely don't want to break anything, but snow really is a great insulator. Uh, and so, especially if we're in a deep freeze uh, with snow, I really try to try to kind of coat those roses uh, in a blanket of snow so that they um, so that they're insulated a little bit better. So. That's about it, though, when it comes to to true winter care. Um, the other thing in Colorado that's 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 really tricky, though, is patience, um, because we come out of winter, and then we go right back into winter. We have really big problems with uh, with a freeze thaw cycle. Um, honestly, we'll see. I think a majority of the dieback on our plants in the spring. Uh, just as things emerge and then kind of get frozen back and, and that can be really damaging. So patience is key because we're just we're ready to get them going and, and get them growing. Uh, and so I, I definitely wait on fertilizing uh, until really into um, you know the middle of April. Uh, and the same is true with uh, you know dead and damaged prune. Uh, renewal prune all of those things I won't do until uh, April and after April is uh, the fun part so the great news is that patience throughout the spring uh, in Colorado is really rewarded with an incredible incredible rose show uh, from basically late May until June and then through the summer. Um, it's definitely worth it. Uh, your happy, healthy roses producing, uh, man, it just brings, brings joy and, uh, and is the reason we, uh, we love to grow them. So there you have it. That is my winter rose tale. It's uh, one that's not too harrowing, but uh, certainly important nonetheless. Um, Mine tends to be on the minimalist side, uh, but, uh, but you know, certainly, as I always tell people who call uh, the nursery, you know, it's a lot of winter care is how much work you're willing to put in uh, versus how much reward. And I certainly think a lot of it, uh, you know, all of it helps, uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's a little impractical sometimes for, for everybody. Um, so do what you can and, uh, protect your roses and get them through the winter. And, uh, you know, my, my two biggest takeaways are simply, uh, choose plants that are zone appropriate and then, mulch those plants. Uh, certainly in the first few years you have them, uh, but a little mulch goes a long way. Uh, and, and those are really two great strategies that have, have really helped me.
and uh, enjoy your roses out there and happy growing. Hi, Rose Chat listeners. This is Donna Malazzo speaking to you from sunny Southern California, Gardening Zone 10B. It is mid-October, and rather than enjoying a cool, crisp fall day while wearing a cozy flannel shirt, as I trust many of you are, here it is a steamy 94 degrees. I'm hiding inside the house while our solar panels are soaking up enough rays to keep the air conditioning running on full tilt. I am a consulting Rosarian and past president of the Rose Society of Saddleback Mountain, which meets in Mission Viejo, California, about 30 minutes south of Disneyland. Our current home sits on what can be accurately described as a postage stamp sized lot. Despite the size, since moving here nearly three years ago, I have been able to find room for about 25 roses in my cottage style garden. Nearly all of our roses are in the east-facing front garden, and our neighbors have been very appreciative of the improvements we have made since we moved in, regularly complimenting us on how nice the garden looks. Speaking about winter rose care from such a mild climate as ours seems a bit strange. It's so mild here, in fact, that when we host our annual Rose Society Christmas parties in December, We have members who are able to bring giant bouquets of roses right out of their gardens as centerpieces. And some rose varieties actually show their prettiest colors in the cooler winter weather. The roses never go truly dormant here, and winter care is more a matter of grooming and tidying the garden than protection or concerns about frost damage. That said, I don't trim and feed the roses in the same manner all year round but do give the plants a chance to rest a bit in the winter by skipping fertilization and deadheading. I often wish that we did have colder temperatures in the winter. If we did, it is my understanding that the cold weather might kill off the chili thrips that have invaded our gardens of late, that have turned our warm season rose gardening from relatively easy to a much larger challenge. We get very little rainfall here, so it's important to keep a close watch on our irrigation situations even during winter time. Some gardeners in our area install rain sensors that are designed to automatically adjust irrigation times based on weather conditions. I'm sure that these devices may work well for some gardeners, but I just cannot trust the welfare of my garden to an unseeing, unfeeling box of wires that could never care for the garden the way I do. We have drip irrigation, and we do dial that system way back during the cooler months, but it is a very rare occasion indeed when the irrigation is turned completely off, and that would only be in the instance of a sustained period of rain. Did I mention we don't get much rain? Starting around mid-December and through January, our local garden centers carry a pretty good selection of dormant roses. This is the time of year when I decide if any of my current roses have fallen into the shovel prune category, although I try very hard to give them at least three years before making that decision. I have good luck starting new bare root or dormant plants in black plastic five gallon nursery pots, which allow the warm soil in the pot to give the roots a jump start for a few months, rather than planting them directly into the cooler garden soil where the roots would develop more slowly. Although many local rose gardeners start pruning as early as mid-January, pruning time for me is around mid to late February. I find that this timing gives my best bloom around mid-April, and this coordinates very nicely with the cool season hardy annuals that I like to grow from seed, that include bread seed poppies, corn cockle, and sweet peas. What a sight it is when everything is blooming at the same time. It's just magical. When I prune, I generally trim my roses back about a third to one half overall size, open up the center of the plants, and generally tidy up the shape to suit their location in the garden. All the foliage is removed at this same time from both the plant and the soil underneath in order to minimize overwintering pests and diseases. Well, 
I do have one lady banks rose, and maybe, just maybe, she doesn't get quite all of her foliage removed. After pruning is done and before new growth appears, I spray with a copper fungicide to knock down rust spores and use conserve spinosad for the chili thrips. I begin feeding again when a few inches of new growth appears and lay, then lay down a new layer of mulch as a finishing touch. And really, that is about it. We would love for you to join us on Facebook under Rose Society of Saddleback Mountain, where you can see photos of some of our members' gardens and where I share notifications for the latest episodes of the Rose Chat Podcast. Thanks so much for allowing me to participate in this fun and informative project. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.